In a world where almost everything is digital, our giving at church has become largely digitized, meaning that where most churches used to pass the plate in person physically every week, now most of that in a lot of churches is replaced by giving online or giving through their app which we're going to talk about what are the effects of that both good and maybe not so good and what are some things that we need to keep in mind because of this shift that has happened largely because of COVID-19. Now I will say I am a massive proponent of online giving. Having been an executive pastor it is unbelievably helpful when you can predict giving and one of the best ways to be able to predict giving is if it's automated and it's online very rarely do people miss a giving miss a gift miss a donation if it's automated they actually have to go in and turn it off but there are some people who say yeah but i don't like that because it doesn't feel as worshipful how do you speak about this how do you think about it how do you talk about it we're going to get into all of this today i want to hear your thoughts as well but we're going to share a article here on Christianity Today from Daniel Darling. I'm going to read through it, give some thoughts and some lessons that we can take away as we are leading our churches holistically, not just to follow Jesus in kind of a lifestyle way, but also where our treasure actually is. And that has a lot to do with our giving. So that is today's episode. This is episode 50 of the Preaching Donkey Podcast. It's so awesome to have you joining me today. I am Lane Sebring, your humble host. It's great to have you with me. This is Preaching Donkey. We typically talk about preaching, talk about how to prepare and deliver effective and compelling messages, but we also talk about how we speak in church across the board. And giving is a big, big part of some of the things that you have to deal with if you want to have a fully funded ministry. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But I want to offer you something as a way to say thank you for stopping by, whether you're here on YouTube watching or you're listening on one of the many podcast players. So awesome to have you. Go to preachingdonkey.com slash 21 days. You can pick up my free 21 day guide to creating killer sermons. It is a three week, three step process that will walk you through how to create and deliver a compelling message. So whether you've been preaching for a long time or you're just getting started and you're trying to figure out how to do this, there's something in there for you. So I want you to go grab it, preachingdonkey.com slash 21 days. And also, if you haven't checked out some of the courses that we have available to you over at Preaching Donkey, go to preachingdonkey.com and click on courses or just go to preachingdonkey.com slash courses and you'll see that we've got a great course called Killer Sermons Academy that's based on the book Preaching Killer Sermons. It goes way more in depth. It's very helpful. It's a complete system for preparing, delivering messages within a church setting, everything from working with your preaching team to working with and, and even developing a preaching team, if you don't know what that is, to getting a preaching workflow, a sermon prep workflow to how to deliver the message and how to do everything in between. It's a really awesome course, and I would love for you to look into it. If you haven't yet, preachingdocu.com slash courses will take you there. Click on Killer Sermons Academy. All right, so let's jump into this. What happens when apps replace the offering plate? This is Daniel Darling, and this is on Christianity Today. And there's a lot that he says in this article that I really resonate with because he obviously has had the perspective of having grown up in church, which I did as well, way before there was apps, way before there was anything, way before the internet, honestly. I, I'm, I was born in the 80s. So there's a lot of things uh, that I remember from church connected to the physical aspect of giving, like the offering plate would pass by. And he's going to talk about that, and I can relate. Maybe you can relate as well, but either way, we're going to get into all of this and how the kind of shift that has happened uh, affects all of us. So he says, I saw an offering plate before I was even old enough to attend church. My father was a lay elder and church treasurer. This usually meant I got to stay and play with friends long after the services were finished. I had that same thing. My, my parents weren't treasurers, but they would just stay and talk forever and I got to go play outside because God, because dad was counting the offering plate. The offering plate is an indelible is indelible in my mind as any image from uh, over four decades of attending church. That smooth wooden bowl with the felt liner that got, yes, uh, this is like so many memories, like the red felt liner in the offering plate would pass down every row as we gather for worship. I also remember watching my father help pass the plate on Sundays and hearing my mother write a check 
trying to write fast enough to beat the plate to the row while also muffling and tearing sound as she tore her tithe from the checkbook. This is really vivid and it's a it's a fun picture. It's a fun thing to think about. It's like it's like a picture from days gone by. I remember being in church as a really young kid and I remember my parents passing the plate over me like they would just pass it to the to the next person to just skip right over me and I wanted to touch the plate. I wanted to be a part of that process and I remember getting so offended. I mean, now I kind of understand it because I was like four years old and they didn't want me handling it. It has money in it, all that. But I remember as a kid being incredibly, incredibly offended by that. He goes on, these rhythms of giving, the passing of the plate, the invitations to generosity, the scriptural text that urge us, urge us towards holding our treasures loosely, like Matthew 6, 19 through 20, gradually work their way into my own life as habits. They started as dropping a few quarters into the Sunday school offering as a child, throughout, developed throughout college, into family life as a married man with children. The opportunity to serve as an usher allowed me to exercise my gifts in the church early on, heading towards my future calling as a minister of God's people. It's hard to imagine Sundays without the offering, the Sunday offering. And yet, this is not just an act of imagination, but a reality. The physical act of giving is a tradition that's quickly falling out of fashion, especially in more contemporary church settings. There are good reasons for this, of course. We live in an increasingly cashless society where few people have physical money in their wallet. Many churches have begun skipping the plate passing in favor of drop boxes or baskets uh, toward the back of the sanctuary. Absolutely, this is something that we did when COVID-19 happened. We stopped passing the plate, put the, put the boxes in the back, and it should become kind of a, a thing that is the kind of normal part of our church. But I will say it's interesting how you have to, as a pastor, you have to minister to and exist in the context in which you live. And I think one of the things he points out in this paragraph is that we have increasingly become a cashless society. And this is very true. And also, we have become a society that doesn't write physical checks. I mean, think about the last time that you pulled out a piece of paper and wrote things on it, like an amount, a number, and signed it and gave it to someone. I mean, it's very unlikely that anybody listening still writes as many checks as you did even maybe 10 years ago, right? We just don't write checks as much. So if the whole system is built on somebody having cash or even loose change or checks that they can physically write and then put into an envelope, my first encouragement to you would be get some option where they can set up their giving and do it online because you're missing out on a lot of revenue, but also you're missing out on giving people the opportunity to be consistent with their giving. He goes on, an online giving which uh, the state of the plate reported was used by 79% of churches five years ago has become as essential a facet of ministry as a church website. It's interesting, if 79% of churches used online giving five years ago, I'm guessing that number has been pushed up in the last couple years. I'm guessing if it was 79, it's probably higher. I don't have any stats on that. Christian tech companies such as Tidely, Pushpay, and Antidote, offer simple solutions that virtually eliminate any friction in the payment process. Yes, I've been a part of using uh, PushPay. Great company, fees are very high, but they deliver a good product. What's more, there is nothing in scripture that specifically prescribes passing the plate as part of the worship service. This is something that you have to understand. If something in your church is a tradition, that's fine. If you've always done it that way, it's fine. Sometimes though, you have to separate yourself from just we've always done this to what's the most effective thing now. In fact, plate passing, at least in America, is a fairly recent tradition starting started in the 1800s with the elimination of state-funded churches. That's interesting. So we're only going back a couple hundred years to when this actually started. Another social phenomenon, COVID-19, exacerbated in the modern trend. In the early days of the pandemic, when it was thought that surface contact spread the virus, churches quickly worked to make everything touchless. The offering plate was the first casualty in favor of already existing online options. You know, another thing that I think is, has been a really good shift is I've seen a lot of churches that not only stopped passing a physical plate, but went virtual virtual with their message notes and their kind of information. So instead of handing everybody a piece of paper that they're just going to put in their seat and cause a bunch of litter, 
they actually just have those things connected to their app, to their website. You can check it on your phone, uh, and you can even have it on the screen where they can they can just look and maybe your QR code, which will bring up the website if they want to go to it. The other option is texting. So instead of having a a piece of paper, they've got a five digit number. You just text the number and it gives you all the information you need, that day's message notes. There's all kinds of resources like that. Saves you time, saves you money, and it keeps uh, the the waste from piling up. Because let's say that you have a church where you expect 200 people there on Sunday. So you print maybe 220 of these pieces of paper, 180 people show up, you waste 40, the 180 people barely read it, they leave it around. It just ends up being a lot of waste where if you can digitize that, it goes a long way. He goes on, I have mixed emotions. As a pastor, I know how helpful online giving can be as an option for church members. It can be a form of accountability, allowing church members to keep their commitments current, setting up automatic bank drafts that pull funds. In a way, this digital format is a throwback to the language of the Old Testament, where generosity was seen as giving the first fruits, Proverbs 3, 9. Generally speaking, to tithe was to willingly yield the first part of your crops and your livestock to the service of the Lord. You didn't give after you provided your family. You gave before you provided for your family. A monthly digital withdrawal may be less visible, but it's no less a commitment. I remember having this debate a few years ago in a church that I was serving as a pastor, and I remember we were we were a little behind on this, really behind on automated giving. We had an online giving option where you could just go and donate as a one-off, but there was some resistance to the idea of automated giving. And I remember the argument was giving is an act of worship. Setting up an automated payment is not an act of worship. That was the argument. And so if somebody sets up an automated payment to the church, then it somehow diminishes the act of worship that giving would have been if they would have given in person at the church or even a one-time gift that they're physically going, getting on the computer, getting on their phone and making a donation. But He makes this argument, and I I fully agree, recurring payments can be a kind of spiritual discipline that ensures generosity is not subject to our personal budgetary whims. This technology makes it easier to plan generosity rather than scourging for a few bills on a Sunday morning. Our family has practiced this for several years and we found it helpful. I fully agree. I think that when we set up our automated giving, And we know that every single month, X amount of dollars is going to come out right away and go straight to the church. Then we build around that. I've heard it put this way. I think it was Giving Rocket who talks about this in their giving training for pastors, that you automate the important. And, And that's one way to talk about it with your church, that our mortgage is automated. Why? Because it's important. We don't want to miss a mortgage payment. So it's set up to automatically pay. Our car payment is automated. Why? Because we don't want to get behind on a car payment. So we automate that. Literally every single bill that we have in our lives is automated so that we never miss a payment and so that we always are on time paying it. Well, that doesn't mean it's any less important, right? I mean, we've paid the payment and it's getting done. When it comes to the church, we don't want to miss a opportunity to give. It's not a payment. It's an opportunity to give to the Lord's work. We don't want to miss that. It's important. So we automate it because it's important. So if in your church, if you're having trouble with this kind of question of giving and you want to automate it, you want to give people at least the opportunity to automate it, use that language. You automate what's important. This is important. So you automate it. And setting that into motion is an act of giving. He says, and yet when that plate would pass in front of us in church, I'd experience a twinge of guilt. Even though I'd given, I still feel I should put something in that plate. I'm not sure if this is a carnal desire to want to be seen giving, Matthew 6, 1 through 4, as if I should hold up a sign that says, don't worry, I give online to assure my fellow members that I'm not avoiding my responsibilities, or if it's a bit of wistful nostalgia for the years I spent dropping envelopes. For many, the ritual commitment, writing that check every week has been replaced by a one-time commitment to automated recurring payments. It still requires sacrifice, but the act is less like a liturgy and more like a one-time walk up the aisle. That's an interesting take. And I, I think I'll, you know, if you're in a church that passes the plate, and you give online, you might feel that pressure. You know, every single week you never give a dime, but you are giving online. But again, giving is not supposed to be something that we do in 
public. It's not. It's supposed to be done in secret. This is what Jesus said to do. When you give, do it in secret, not as the hypocrites do that just want to be seen for their giving. So I think there's something to be said about the anonymity of online giving. And like I said, I am telling you, when you're managing church funds, if you're the one who kind of has your eye on church funds, if you're in that kind of position, or you're you know you're lead the team that does that, there is nothing like having automated giving where if you can get a lot, here's here's where it comes in really, really handy. When you have to close your church down because of inclement weather, right? So Sunday's coming, big wet, big winter storm. If you live in the in Tennessee where I do, everything shuts down, right? Every if there's a flurry of snow, oh, we can't do anything. So if you have one of those days where you're gonna not have a church service, I was in a church for about 10 years that did not have automated giving, didn't have really any kind of good system for automated giving, had a little bit of online giving, but it was a very small percentage of people that would give online. It's about maybe 10, 15% of people would give online. The other 80 or 90% would give if they were there. So what happened when we missed a Sunday? If we were closed on a Sunday, it meant that instead of, let's say we needed to hit $100,000 in giving in a week, we would have literally Twenty or thirty thousand dollars come in. If that number sounds ast- uh, astronomical or, or whatever, d- just don't get hung up on the number. Whatever your budget is, whatever you need in a week. Let's say it's ten thousand dollars in a week. Well, if you only get two thousand, you're missing out on a ton of revenue that you depend on as a church. You still have bills to pay. You still have payroll to make. This is the thing people don't understand. Like you're an organization that is funded on gifts. So if those gifts don't come in, it's a big, big deal. And by the way, the next Sunday when you open back up, you don't always make up for that. I mean, you know this. Fast forward to another church that I was at where it was literally the opposite. 80% of our people were giving online. Most of those were automated. So if we missed a Sunday because of inclement weather, it had almost no effect on our overall giving. I mean, very, very marginal effect. So that's kind of a practical reason. And I think like if you don't get so hung up on it has to be done in a certain way, then I think you can you can really benefit from the the act of helping people to automate their giving. Now, one of the things that I highly recommend that I fully suggest that kind of... Uh, works through this tension because he goes on to say, I'm not going to read the rest of it. You can check it out yourself. He goes on to talk about how pastors are going to have to figure out what is the balance of this tension? How do we have a system whereby people can automate their giving online, but we still have this act of worship that's happening in the service where used to be they would pass the plate, you'd physically put the envelope in there, and that would be your act of worship and giving. The way to solve that is to have a giving talk every single uh, service, every single church service. When you used to pass the plate, go ahead and do a giving talk. And instead of passing the plate, you're saying, hey, here's how you can give online, suchandsuchchurch.com slash give. You can give online. You can text to give. And then talk about the importance of giving. Show where the money is going, who you're helping, how you're helping them. Uh, show lives that have been changed. Maybe if giving is down, talk about how you need to increase it. Whatever the case, connect the heart to the gift and then point to the medium of giving. That's all we're really discussing is the medium of giving. It, does it have to be a physical plate or can it be online? And we're in a world where it's just going to be online and for a lot of reasons, that's better and best. So you might as well help people connect that to worship. So one of the ways that you can do this is when you give do your giving talk, you can talk about the people who have automated their gifts. And you can say, for those of you who have given online and those of you who have a recurring gift, you know, Take this time to pray through uh, and pray that God would use your gift to change lives here in this community, that he would use your gifts and your donations to help us to continue and further our mission that you're a part of. Like bring the heart of that to the situation that they're in where they've already given or they've planned to give and it's automated and online. That's my two cents. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. I'd love to hear from you, especially if you're watching here on YouTube. Go ahead and comment below. But if you're uh, watching or listening on one of the podcast players, love you so much. So glad you're there. Be sure to leave a review. Let me know. Email me if you have any thoughts on this. I'd love to hear from you. Be sure to come back next time. And remember, if God can speak through a donkey, He can speak through you and he can speak through me. We'll see you next time here on the Preaching Donkey Podcast.